Welcome to the History Extra podcast. Fascinating historical conversations from the makers of BBC History magazine. It would be fair to say that Second World War pilot Eric Winkle Brown led an extraordinary life. He narrowly escaped death when his ship was torpedoed, smashed flying world records and had several unlikely encounters with the movers and shakers of his time. Speaking to Emily Briffitt, Paul Beaver, the author of a new biography of Brown, charts some of his astonishing adventures and remarkable escapades. So we are going to be talking all about your new book, Winkle, The Extraordinary Life of Britain's Greatest Pilot. And this is all about Eric Brown. Now, to situate our listeners, can you tell us a little bit about who Eric was and why should he be on our radar? It's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, um, I, I called him Eric for the whole 40 years that I knew him, but, but uh, most people know him as Winkle. And, and Winkle uh, is the nickname that the Fleet Air Arm gave him because he was the shortest pilot um, in the Fleet Air Arm. I mean, he claimed to be five foot seven. His, his military record said he was five foot six. An inch is important when you're, uh, when, when you're a pilot, I suppose. But... Um, Eric Brown was a remarkable character. Uh, he went from being a foundling. He was born in the Salvation Army Hospital in Hackney. Um, so, sorry, Scots, he's not a true Scotsman. Um, but he was put on a train and adopted by a couple in Edinburgh, and he became a Scot. I mean, he was more Scot than, than the Scots are. Um, a remarkable character. The key to it was he was the most outstanding handling test pilot the world has ever known and you know we put britain in there because americans would sue us on uh, if, if you know because they, there must be an american who's better than a brit but he was truly the best i mean 487 types of aircraft 2407 um deck landings 2271 catapult launches nobody will ever do that again um no there aren't 487 types of airplane and that includes, for example, 14 different types of Spitfire. So, you know, this, this is a remarkable man uh, who went through the 20th century meeting people, usually by accident, that we all read about. Um, he had King George VI say to him when he went for yet another investiture at Buckingham Palace, what, you again? Um, you know, that's the sort of the sort of bloke he was, a remarkable bloke. His life just seems to be one that's so full of escapades. It's almost an adventure story, really. <laughs> there are dramatic crashes and amazing firsts and meetings, as you've said, with people that were just, it seems crazy to us now. He is quite remarkable um, in, in, in that regard. I think that they will say um, that chance favours the prepared mind. I think he was always prepared. I mean, it's one of the things... You know, 23 crashes and near-death experiences. You've got to be quite clever to get out of that. You know, being inverted um, in an aeroplane in the Atlantic, the aeroplane sinking, and not panicking. And that was the other thing. So I first met him before I'd started military flying. I, I was lucky enough to be an Army Air Corps officer. Um, when I went off to, to, um, uh, to the Army Air Corps, he said to me, OK, dear boy, and I won't try and do his Edinburgh accent, but you know, there are two things uh, that you need to, to know. is always know your numbers. In other words, your speeds and the speed not to exceed and the landing speed and the stalling speed, all these things. Just keep those in the back of your head. And the other is always, whether it's in a car, an aeroplane or in the house, have two means of escape. So always have in your mind, you go into, even going into a restaurant, he said, you think about, well, is there a back door? If there's a fire at the front, can I get out the back? He was all about surviving. Um, and, you know, and his survive he did. I mean, if you, in, in the book, there are pictures of some of the crashes and you go, no, you can't walk away from that one. But he did. No, I think you've given us a little bit of an insight there. But as you said, you actually knew Eric. Could you tell us a little bit more about what he was like and how did you actually come to write his biography? So uh, this, to me, is also a fabulous story. Back in 1978, um, I was writing my first book, which was about the aircraft carrier HMS Art Royal. I had a technical question about why a certain aeroplane wasn't used on the ship. So I asked the Fleet Air Arm Officers Association 
if they could con put me in contact with Eric Brown. And those were the days when you didn't have GDPR and, and whatever. So they just gave me his, his, uh, uh, his address. So I wrote to him and I said, you know, dear Captain Brown, blah, blah, blah. And he, he called me back. He must, it, it's also the days when the post got there the next day. Um, and he called me back the next morning about nine o'clock and said, um, this is a very complex question, dear boy. It needs a lot of answering. Um, I don't think it's worth putting it on paper. Come to lunch Sunday, 12.30, be there. And it was sort of, I sir. Um, and that started it. And we, we just got on like a house on fire. Um, I'm obviously in awe of him, um, having already been a pilot by that time for about 15 years, a, a, a private pilot. Um, I, and you know, with the intention of, of going in and, and flying it as a late entry into uh, uh, into the Army Echo, into the reserve of the Army Echo. Um, I was really keen to, to sort of capitalise on, on all his knowledge. Um, and almost every book that I've, I've written, I've written a few, um, he comes into it in, in some way. My book on Spitfires, for example, Spitfire People, um, he did the intro um, for that uh, because the, the you know, there was nobody else alive who'd flown 14 different marks of Spitfire and all the marks of Seafire. So, you know, what a great character. But when it comes to writing the biography, it's something I'd not really considered until um, probably about 2009, something like that. Um, and we thought it was his 90th birthday. It turns out it was his 89th. A lot of stuff about changing birth certificates in order to become a Scot of a certain age to play international rugby as a schoolboy for Scotland. But that's, that's a rabbit hole we won't go down now. Um, and so what, what then happened was that he, uh, he said to me, well, you know, what I'd really like, uh, um, what I'd really like to do is to have uh, a dinner party with some people who I can talk to at, you know, at a really detailed level. So to get into the dinner party, you had to either be a qualified test pilot or a qualified display pilot. Now, I'd just get in on the back of that because at the time I was displaying the Army's uh, Beaver and Oster aircraft. So I, I had my own little Cub aeroplane as well. So I, I was flying displays. Um, so that gets, gets me into that party. Um, and it was, it was full of the great and the good of the time. And it was, it was brilliant because it just the conversation flowed until a point in the conversation which which happens with dinner parties where it sort of there was just eric and me and he just turned he was turning to me and saying of course dear boy the second time i saw hitler and across the across the room my old friend phil odell then chief test pilot of rolls royce said hold on a minute what do you mean second time when's the first and it, that it, it, the conversation went from there um, and i and then Phil said, you've, 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 got to, you've got to write this all up because it's not in, in any detail in his supposed autobiography, which turns out was ghostwritten by the Admiralty in 1962. But and again, another, another rabbit hole. Um, and so I called him the next morning and said, you know, can I do this? Can I, can I write your biography? And he said, of course, dear boy. When I pass on, you can have all my papers. I have, I have a whole room of his papers here in, in my house. Um, Everything, everything you want, except the logbooks. Um, and that's a, another uh, thing. But I, I got to see them all and, and copy the, the key pieces out. Um, and he said, you can, you can do this, but only after I've passed. And now I know why. Because everything in the autobiography about the beginning of his life is, uh, to use the technical Air Force um, term, bollocks. Um, and he was a totally different man. In fact, I think he was a much better man. I mean, what other country in the world can you be a foundling on Waverley Station, in Edinburgh, on a cold February day, picked up by a lovely couple and educated at the Royal High School in, in Scotland, then the best school in Scotland, a selective school, um, get a scholarship to Edinburgh University to read modern languages, become a pilot, fly aeroplanes, meet everyone from King George VI several times, um, uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, a drinking pal. Um, you know, it, it just, no, doesn't happen anymore. It happened in the 20th century. 
um, and you know, and then get to fly all these aeroplanes and be at the right time to see the first British jet aeroplane fly purely by accident, and then to fly that aeroplane on its very last flight as the chief naval test pilot at Farnborough, which was the centre of aviation. I mean, what a character. Um, so, Emily, what I wanted to do with the book was not to do a list of all the aeroplanes he flew and what they were like, and he did that himself. His, his series is, is excellent, Wings of the Luftwaffe and Rings of the Navy and things like that. I wanted to tell the story of the man, the man who goes from a foundling to being a national treasure, who is the 3,000th guest on a Desert Island Discs, even though he did slightly embroider his life even on that. But he did manage to charm just about everybody he ever came across, and that's in his early 90s. Remarkable. I want to be like that. So can we chart his story? So if we start right at the beginning, how did he start out? You've spoken about him being a foundling, but where do we go from there? Yeah, so if, if we do his life story in a, in a, in a nutshell, and... We could spend a week talking about his, his life story. It is just remarkable. Um, so, born to a lady called Dorothy, no idea of her surname um, or his father's name um, in Hackney, put on a train by the National uh, Child Adoption Agency. In those days, Scotland didn't have any formal um, adoption requirements. You just needed a letter from your local priest to say you're a good person and you could adopt a child. Um, so he grows up initially in Leith and then in Gower Shields, which is a, um, a mill town on, on, the, on the River Tweed. I mean, the borders of Scotland, they, they, people go on about the highlands, but you know, to me, the borders are, are fabulous. Um, grew up in Gower Shields, commuted every day to Edinburgh. Ironically, travel sick on a train, never, never sick in an aeroplane or on a ship. I mean, how does that work? But um, that goes through all of this um, is the, the runner-up dukes of the school, in other words, the best athlete and the best scholar, um, plays international rugby as a schoolboy for Scotland, um, and then is doing modern languages at university. Um, French is his main subject. He's um, given uh, a, a job, um, a, a sort of a gap year, we call it now, I suppose, um, to go to the Elysee Supérieure de, de Metz, um, in 1939, um, and he goes. Having been to Germany uh, with his father before that, he decides, well, I might just go back to Germany. He absolutely adored Germany. The people, the food, the beer, uh, the whole attitude. Um, that's not to say he adored the Nazis. We're talking about the Germans. Um, he goes to, to, to Germany, war breaks out. Um, he's arrested, uh, like all other British students are. Um, and there's, there's a great story around that. Um, he's then expelled to Switzerland, and from Switzerland, with his car, he's able to drive um, to France. Can't take his car on the ferry because of the war, but the RAC say they'll get his car back, and lo and behold, two weeks later in, in, in Edinburgh, uh, his car arrives. I mean, th that wouldn't happen today. Uh, and so he decides that Having been, um, I suppose, having one of his prizes at school was the life of Nelson. So he thought, you know, I'll try the Navy. So he goes to the Navy as a naval seaman, second class, the very lowest of the low. You can't get, the ship's cat is more senior um, to you. Um, goes to St. Vincent um, uh, in Gosport, comes out seventh of the course, um, pilot training in Northern Ireland where he... Um, meets the lady who became his wife, Lynn, um, gets grounded for unauthorised aerobatics, probably uh, hits um, Belfast Cathedral, um, showing off to his girlfriend. I mean, you know, it, it starts, everyone thinks what a wonderful guy is. I got his military record, his, what's called his, his S206. And it, you go through that and you go, did, um, uh, did cause the displeasure of their lordships of the Admiralty for X, Y, and Z, grounded, um, uh, fined, reduced in, in seniority, you know, thousands of things. Hey, he was a regular lad, you know, he flew aeroplanes, he was really good at it. He'd learned to fly, by the way, down in Kent, in, in Westmoreland in Kent, um, and he'd been taught aerobatics at the end of his course, and that's that was it. I mean, he was... Eric was as happy upside down in an aeroplane as he was flying the right way up. And I think that's, that's a really important part because I've got a picture, it's a picture in the book of him um, 
escorting the Prime Minister Winston Churchill's aeroplane, and he's leading the escort upside down. I mean, it's fab. Um, and then, so we've got all of all of that. Um, join, joins a, an aircraft carrier. Um, really dangerous time. The aircraft carrier sunk. He survives because hey, he was prepared. He knew he knew how to survive. Um, and the captain of of the carrier, who sadly drowned uh, when the carrier sank, had already written to the Admiralty and said, "Don't let this young man fly." on carriers uh, on an operational footage because he will die because the, the life expectancy then was about 60% of the, of the air crew were dying. Um, it, this, it was a really horrendous time, 1941-42. The, the captain, McKendrick, said, look, make him, make him a test pilot. Yeah. He's, he's a natural, and he is a natural. He could fly, uh, what did somebody say to me? He could fly the tin roof off a shed um, if, if he needed to. I mean, he was really, really good um, at that. Um, it goes through life, it goes, probably does the greatest feat of the time, which is landing a twin-engined aeroplane in a mosquito on an aircraft carrier. Um, he's the chief naval test pilot. He flies every naval aircraft uh, at Farnborough, the, the seat of aviation. Um, he goes to America after the war and teaches the Americans, including all of the Gemini, naval Gemini um, astronauts, um, s secrets of flying, gets um, uh, hauled up before the Admiral for uh, flying under bridges. He had to think about flying under bridges. He flew under the fourth bridge, the Tay Bridge, and then eventually the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, uh, where, where he gets caught, along with Al Shepard, the first American in space, who was his wingman at the time. I mean, how does this happen? How does this, thing, this sort of thing happen? Um, uh, he flew... Uh, broke the sound barrier in a Sabre jet um, over uh, the airbase and, and destroyed the greenhouse of the Admiral and was fined five dollars to replace it. Um, so he does all of these things. He then becomes a, a regular naval officer. And that's really where he starts to fall down because he's, he's not a team player. He's a test pilot. He's a, he's a, he's a singleton. Um, he doesn't really get on very well with ships um, and with uh, being a navigator and, and all that sort of stuff. Goes back into a bit of flying um, and then finds, again, the Navy are good at this sometimes. They put the, 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 round, the round peg into the round hole. He becomes head of the British Naval Air Mission to Germany. He speaks German. His wife, Lynn, speaks German. The Germans love him. Um, and he sets up what is today the Marina Flieger. Uh, Deutschland, so the German um, uh, fleet air arm equivalent. Um, and then eventually becomes naval attache, um, and he again meets all the, you, know, you, you name the people, including John le Carré, because um, he was in the embassy at the same time. I've got pictures of le Carré and, and Eric at a party. Um, and then he goes um, from that to command Lossiemouth, uh, which is a um, uh, big naval air station. Um, doesn't actually get on that well at Lossy Mouth and is not picked up for promotion, so leaves the Navy um, and goes into aviation. But he's not, he's not re finished yet because he goes into aviation in the beginning of the 70s when helicopters are being used for the first time in the North Sea. And what he's doing then is he's doing the safety cases so that you know, the, the, initially there were lots of crashes, lots of people drowned. OK, they need to have a safety regime. This, this is not wartime flying. It, it, there should be no accident and nobody should be injured. So he works all that out, finishes that, um, starts writing uh, books. His wife dies and he suddenly goes on the, on the lecture tour uh, theatre. He's the only person to have lectured eight times at the Smithsonian in America. I mean, when he died, eight American newspapers had his death notice on the front page. Chicago Tribune, um, Los Angeles Times, New York Times, and something else. I mean, in Britain, it was page 14. But to, in America, the only Brit in the Hall of Fame of the Naval Aviation of America. I mean, all of these things. Uh, his best mate in this time, a guy called Neil Armstrong, may have heard of him, walked on the moon. Um, and they, they, it, it was you know, remarkable. We will never see Emily anybody like Eric Winkle Brown ever again. Uh, he is, he was, he is unique. And, you know, 
I'm, I'm really glad you can, you can see um, there's a lot of work here. Um, six years of work on this, and that was mainly getting it down. I, I took 30,000 words um, out of the book because Penguin said, you know, the problem is if somebody drops this on their toe, um, they, it's going to break their toe if it's, uh, if it's a sort of 700 page book. Um, so, you know, as you can tell, I'm enthusiastic, I'm delighted. Uh, what a great guy. I think I've done him credit and justice um, in, the, in the biography. It's just so extraordinary to hear about. Now, you've said that you cut out 30,000 words. That's, that's an incredible amount of words. It's a book in its own. It is a whole book in its own. <laughs> yeah. What would you have liked to have included if you could have done? Oh, there, there were bits in there from his later life, which I think were, were fun, which showed the party character of him. Um, you know, he was, he'd played um, the drums whilst Lynn, his wife, sang with the Glenn Miller Band. Uh, on their last concert. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, but pick, a, pick a Second World War, you, you know, musician. It's Glenn Miller, isn't it? You, you don't think of anybody else. Um, uh, he, uh, he, I, 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 I couldn't actually stand this up, so it's not in the book. But um, he certainly danced with, with Shirley Bassey um, at parties. Um, the, she was in the, the sort of the Helicopter Club of Great Britain social set or whatever um, at the time. He organised garden parties for helicopters where you could only go to the garden party if you flew in in your own helicopter. So that's a bloody big garden you're going to have to have to have that party. Oh, there are bits like that, that that are really good fun. They don't actually add that much to the character uh, of the man. And the other thing I've managed to do with the, with the book um, is, uh, and you know, thank you to my, uh, my publisher for this, but where... Um, where I have cut pieces out, uh, we've got a hundred pictures in there, and the the captions are there. So there's the captions about his skiing. Um, his wife was a better skier. Um, always a bit of a problem for him uh, that she was there. She also Lynn, Lynn was a fabulous lady. Um, I, I I had some great great times with her. Um, uh, so when I first met him, I said, do I call you Captain Brown? And before he had finished, Lynn had burst in and said, call him Eric. He's called Eric Paul. He's not called Winkle. I don't like that term. He's called Eric. Um, that's approximately her Northern Ireland accent with a bit of Scots in there, probably. Um, but um, he, um, he and Lynn just were a fabulous pair together. She spoke, um, after their, uh, their time in Germany, she spoke what's called Bonnerisch, which is a sort of a slang German, whereas he spoke Hochdeutsch, so he would say, I say, fine fellow, could you kindly direct me to the, the train station? And she'd say, hey, mate, where's the train station? Um, and and it, she, was, she was brilliant. She was blonde. She wore a red dress to every party. I've got pictures, not in the book, um, pictures of her at parties. And um, she's the centre of attention. All these German admirals are just all open-mouthed around her. What a fabulous bit of soft power and diplomacy uh, for the United Kingdom. And that was the other thing. Eric did not approve of the Scots National Party, did not approve of devolution, he did not approve of breaking up the Union. Um, he didn't also approve of the European Union, which he called um, potentially the Fourth Reich. But we won't go down the politics uh, bit there. But um, you know, he was a man of, of, of his own opinions. Um, he was a man um, who would not suffer fools gladly. So in 40 years, I'm just delighted to have um, to spent time with him. I mean, you know, uh, I can't tell you that I've probably forgotten more interesting things about Eric than, than even they're in the book. And the book is 544 pages or something. It's just so full of shocking moments. It is what I said earlier. It's, it's, it's a total adventure story. Isn't it? What would you say were his major achievements? And do you think that he would maybe say his major achievements were something different to what you would suggest? He would say his major achievements were surviving. He survived at a time when we'd lost um, uh, the end of the war into the 50s. We were, we'd lost 500 test pilots and flight test engineers at Farnborough and Bedford alone. And it's just the Brits. It was a really dangerous time. Um, people were flying aeroplanes. We're not quite understanding how they were working. Uh, we were going for the sound barrier, so fast as, you know, faster than the speed of sound, trying to beat the Americans to that. They won in the end, mainly because the government here um, sort of wouldn't, wouldn't fund it. Um, 
So uh, there's, there's, and there's a whole story about that. But I think he would say he survived. He survived the most interesting and testing time in aviation, propellers to jets, going to the sound barrier, um, you know, uh, aircraft carriers, combat, um, all, all of those things. For me, I mean, I can list off his firsts, um, you know, like first twin engine, first jet on an aircraft carrier, first turboprop on an aircraft carrier, first twin engine jet on an aircraft carrier, first tricycle undercarriage. Now, that might all seem a bit, a bit sort of small and technical, but if you don't have all of those things, somebody has to do it first so that you can then develop it. So today, when you watch Top Gun 2 and you see Tom Cruise landing uh, uh, an F-18 on the deck of the carrier, all of that is the development work that people like Eric did. They're all British inventions, the steam catapult, the, the angled deck, the mirror landing site, all of the stuff that's used to bring aircraft back at night was all British um, in the 50s. He, he took it to America, gave it to the Americans. That was our, our, our policy at the time, um, to give it to the Americans. They had the money to develop it. We worked together on it, which is why the US Navy and the fleet arm are so close today, why Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales um, are quite happy to take American um, Marine Corps um, F-35s on board because we work, we work with, with the Americans uh, really well. And he loved that, that bit about working with the Americans. They treated him as an equal, not as some colonial boy from a small country off the coast of Europe. Um, so what is Eric? Yeah, Eric's first, I think, are good. Um, I think what I like also is Eric did a great service for aviation and, and, and aeronautics. Um, he got a whole bunch of people into it who were interested. He became president of the Royal Aeronautical Society, for example. Um, I think his achievements across aviation are huge. Um, and he was an outstanding person to, to have a to, as a dinner party guest. To give you an example, his last dinner party, um, this is about a month before he died, um, which was in a Bucks Club in London. Um, and I'd organised for David Cameron, who was then Prime Minister, to send him a letter. Um, and David Cameron also sent him a signed bottle of champagne. Um, and uh, we, were, we were having this, this dinner. There were 90 people there, the great and the good of aviation. And I said to him, do you want to say a few words? And he said, I'd like to. And he got up, spoke for an hour without notes and had everybody absolutely enthralled. And he was then 95 years old, 96 years old. Quite, quite remarkable. I mean, I, how, how, do you, how do you better that? And I look around today, you know, who else is out there? Uh, I hate to say it. There's nobody, nobody with his character, his stature and with his achievements um, in any, any country, anywhere. It's so easy to see how he's almost earned this legendary and inspirational mm. status. How would you say perceptions have perhaps changed of him since his first biography or autobiography, whatever we may call it? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, Eric is in, in the fleet arm of the Royal Navy, a bit Marmite. There are a lot of old people who suffered under his command at, um, sorry, more senior people who suffered under his command at, at Lossiemouth, who would tell you he was a martinet and, and unreasonable. And, um, you know, I, I met somebody the other day, I did a talk at Yeovilton at uh, the Fleet Arm Museum, and somebody came up to me afterwards and said, you know, you've done warts and all in the book. You, you've got his bad points and his good books, uh, points. You know, he once admonished me, and I have it on my service record, uh, without allowing me to justify what I'd done. He said, today that's unacceptable. Um, he said, so, uh, Winkle, I, I, I'll read the book, didn't like the person. And then you go to other people, um, the Bishop's Waltham Aviation Group. That's a very small group of lovely people, about 50 of them. Um, and they said, would you become our patron? And he wrote back immediately. I've got all his letters, so I've got all the responses as well. And he said, straight away, oh, yes, of course, that's great. Um, you know, I'll come down and do an annual lecture. Well, they've kindly invited me. I, I've taken over as the patron, um, and I do the annual lecture in March uh, at Bishop's Waltham. Of course, it's always about Eric. Um, and it, it, it's that sort of thing. Nobody, he did not, he, 
He didn't suffer fools, but he allowed fools to write to him and he would respond and say, no, you've got that wrong. It was X or Y or whatever. So I think that the, 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 the great bit about Eric at the end of the day is this legacy that he leaves us of somebody who lived through the 20th century, met many of the great people of the 20th century, took aviation, naval aviation especially, on leaps and bounds, um, and, and for that matter, jet aviation, did a lot of work that created te uh, systems, technical systems for uh, today's airliners, safety cases for uh, helicopters flying off North Sea rigs, uh, which of course is the applied now, you know, whether it's Indonesia or the Gulf of Mexico, um, and has entertained us ever since because, hey, you know, here we are talking about this man who was born in 1920 um, in Hackney in the Salvation Army Hospital who could have been gone nowhere. Um, and, you know, he ends up being the greatest pilot, I think the greatest pilot ever. Um, and, you know, the lawyers say we have to put Britain in there. Sorry, America. You haven't got anyone like him. On that note, is there anything that you would like to leave us with? Any stories or tales or particular moments you think really represent Eric and the life he lived? There are so many stories, Emily, about, about Eric and, 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 uh, and the way he lived and the things that he did and the, the places he went to. Um, I think the... the what lessons can we get from from Eric's life is important, particularly if you're uh, if you're young, you're thinking of going to the armed forces, you know, and if you be, might even be flying in, in the Royal Navy. I think the key thing about Eric um, is his determination and the fact he was always prepared. Um, it didn't matter where it was. He was about ninety when uh, he was involved in a serious car accident, and the uh, the police told me afterwards, and it, because I, you know, I I was sort of part of the, almost part of the family. The police told me afterwards that, uh, that a, a lorry had hit his car and the, the driver's seat was completely demolished, the driver's side uh, was completely demolished, and they expected to be picking up pieces of human body. And they found him. Um, uh, he was, uh, I think he was unconscious, but they found him in the passenger seat well, rolled into a ball, only five or six, you can do that. Um, in the crash position, as it's called, um, having survived the impact, having been quick enough at 90 to undo his seatbelt and roll into the passenger seat. You, you have to be pretty fit. I'm not sure I could do that. Um, roll into the seat because he knew what was going to happen. Split, split second timing. So if there's a lesson of Eric's life, it's be prepared, keep notes, um, remember everything. And he would say... And always take a small dram at night with some warm water to help you sleep. There you go. That's it. I think that's an excellent point for us to leave it on. Thank you so much for talking with me today, Paul. Great pleasure, Emily. Thank you for listening to my story about Eric.